Guys, um, we are, are starting off, uh, I, I put a post out there this week uh, based on a scripture I read and, uh, you know, I titled it, Do You Have Flood Insurance? And I think everybody had, you know, uh, had heard the joke about a flood coming and a guy climbs up on the rooftop and the flood is getting higher and higher and he pr prays to God for help. The guy comes in the rowboat, says, get in the rowboat. He goes, nope. He goes, I'm waiting for God to save me. Guy comes in the speedboat, water's getting higher. You know, guy says, get in the boat. He says, no, I'm waiting for God to save me. A helicopter comes when the water's up at the roof. And then all of a sudden he's like, get in the helicopter. And no, I'm waiting for God to save me. And, you know, when he gets to heaven, he's like, God, why didn't you save me? He says, I sent the boat. I sent the speedboat. I sent the helicopter. And oftentimes people don't recognize God's answer to prayer. And a lot of times, you know, we get in a place of chaos. And, and because we allow so much emotion to come in our lives, that we don't recognize God in the midst of that. You know, we've we've seen changes, you know, uh, in an election and, and, and different things going on. And I tell people all the time, they call me about real estate, Greg, you know, how is this going to affect the market? And so everything that we do is strategy. I know that Juan Ian and I had a talk and, and, you know, I had a talk with several other people, you know, just about change, but setting yourself up strategically for the blessing and a lot of people right now are going through a place of what I talked about last week was critical mass. And, and it's that that dark night of the soul. It's it's the weight of of, you know, first off, God pushing you and the enemy on the other end, pushing against you. And it's all of that pressure. And I talked last week because I, you know, I, I heard a little blog thing on, on Mario Murillo where he talked about when an atom splits that right before the split happens that the atom looks like it's going to die. It actually flattens and deflates and it looks like it's dead right before power is released. And I can tell you in my own life, right before breakthrough, I've had some of my worst nights before breakthrough. You know, God gave me a word, uh, January 23rd was a day for breakthrough and today's the 23rd. And, you know, yesterday and the day before, I just felt a lot of just kind of oppression trying to come into my life. And I know a lot of people are going through this season where they're feeling this pressure or like things are just falling apart. So, so what I want to do today is just give you some words of encouragement as far as God's plan. But I wanted to give you some tools. Kristen Kinsey's out in the front yard and she's looking for a way to get in. Um, what I wanted to do is give you guys some tools um, just to help you. And this isn't just for this season. Any time that oppression or things aren't working out your way, uh, I want to give you some tools as far as exactly how you should respond. So anyways, I'm going to go ahead and start this with Acts 16 and verse 25 and 26. And it says, about midnight, Paul and Silas, they were in prison. You got to remember, they just, they dealt with a spirit of divination in a woman. She was a, um, I believe it was a spirit of divination, and they cast out the demon out of this woman who had followed Paul around for three days and finally said, come up and out of her, you know, and it was interesting. He used discernment because, you know, she was going around saying, these are men of God, but he recognized the spirit, even though what she was saying was the truth, it came from a demonic spirit. So he cast that thing out. And what had happened is he took the sole source of revenue from two guys that had her you know, uh, uh, you know, as a, as a servant for them, she was making money. So anyways, they end up in prison, right? So they're in prison and it says in Acts 16, 25 through 26, it says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. I'm going to keep coming back to this because this is going to be my text. They're in a place right now of darkness. Thank you for reminding me about the notes. They're in a place of darkness, right? They're in a prison. A prison is a place of bondage and decay. So they are prisoners in a place of darkness. And it says they were praying and singing, singing uh, hymns of praise. So they were praying and they were praising God in the midst of a messed up situation. So we have to understand anytime that there's pressure in our lives, that authority is not recognized unless it's challenged. We have to also recognize that, you know, what I talked about a couple, probably a couple months ago in Exodus 23 and 30, God says, little by little, 
I'm going to drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the entire land. So I use that as a depiction in our heart that we are taking ground, but make no mistake about it. Anytime you are going to take ground, you are going to face an adversary who is always going to try and take back that ground. So it's not something that we're paranoid. It's something that we're aware of. When I'm at the altar and I'm praying for the sick, every time I'm dealing with something, somebody may need a healing. Somebody may be dealing with affliction. Some person may be demonized to a level that, hey, we got to cast this thing out. It's not that I'm worried about it. It's I'm aware of the enemy's schemes that are going on. But I am moving forward. And if I, and if when I move forward or if when I take ground, there is a, a, a enemy from the pit of darkness that steps up, we break his back and we keep moving forward. But we have to understand that the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. So authority is always going to be recognized before it's challenged, right? And we have to understand that in order for you to get to a next level, there's going to be opposition. When you break the back of the opposition, what's going to happen to that opposition, the same oppositions, whether it's cancer, whether it's poverty, whether it's hardship, what's going to happen to that opposition in somebody else's life? Because you broke through, you can now break them through. So the breakthrough that you're going through right now isn't just for you. It's for the people around you because you are not the end result of the blessing. You are not the end result of your prayer life. Other people are. So the fight and the struggle that you're going through right now, you got to get out of your head that it's just about you. No, it's bigger than you. The kingdom is always bigger than you. You are fighting for the other people, right? So we have to understand that Again, authority is not recognized unless it's challenged. And there is persecution, right? But just like income tax, there's only a persecution on the increase, right? And I covered that last week. Matthew 13, 20 and 21. The parable of the sower in, in, in my belief, I think is a cornerstone of all parables because it always talks about the word of God planting being planted in the heart of an individual, right? Into a child of God. Matthew 13, 20 through 21 says, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and, and, one, and at once receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. Now hear this next part. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So we have a word that's been released in your life, and then it says, when trouble or persecution comes. Why? Because a prophetic word always goes against the flow of the world. A prophetic word is a contrary word. It's a contradictory word. It's going to oppose your circumstance. It's going to oppose your health. It's going to oppose your financial situation, right? It's going to uh, affect your, your, your well-being. So there is going to be opposition. The reason the prophetic comes in your life is you're dealing with an impossibility and through God, all things are possible, right? Luke 1 and 37, it says, for, for, uh, for no word from God will fail. So we have to understand a prophetic word is released into your life. And now there's going to be a challenge of that word. It's not a negative thing because we have to understand if the word comes in your life, grace enables what it commands. So if God is releasing a word in your life, He's giving you the grace in that instruction to overcome the very thing he's speaking about. When I get a word of knowledge about healing, if it's somebody's dealing with cancer and God says, you know, I desire to heal cancer in this person's life. Great. It's not based on my ability. The power and the ability comes through the instruction into my life. And I just align with God and repeat the very thing he said to me and do the very thing he's telling me to do. And his super comes on my natural. So we have to understand that there's persecution. So I put in the notes, tribulation comes because of the word. And, and you got to hear me on this is key. Opposition always creates character. In order for character to be formed and developed in your life, you have to have choices, right? There can, no, there can be no character that would be formed in your life without choices. God is always going to give you a choice. And because God is giving you a choice, there's always going to be that pressure. I talked about worry being the meditation of evil, but worry comes in your life when you have faith and you have fear. They're tugging on you. Why are they tugging on you? Because you're dealing with choices and character can only be developed in a place of choice. Now you got a Paul and Silas that are in a prison 
and they can complain or they can rejoice, right? They have a choice of as, as far as what they're gonna what they're gonna do and the power source that they're actually connected into. So character cannot be formed in us unless we have choices and our character cannot be formed apart from choices. Good morning, JD. So Isaiah 59 and 19, which, which is one of the verses I use. I said, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, it says the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. So it says the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard. Now I want to talk to you about the working of spiritual things, but it says when the enemy comes in, how does the enemy come in? The enemy usually comes in through your emotions, right? And the enemy comes in through other people's emotions. If their life sucks, if their marriage sucks, guess what? They're a person that's in a place of pain. And if they're in a place of pain, guess what? They're going to, they're going to, you know, deflect that pain. Oh, and, and, and the very thing that they're aware of, they're going to release in your life. They're going to release your pain. So all of a sudden now your circumstance is getting worse because a person that's being tormented by the enemy is now attacking you based on their pain. So when people come at you, you have to understand it's not because of you hurt people, hurt people and free people hurt and free people, free people, we have to understand an angry person is angry with themselves. Sometimes with angry people, there's no reasoning. And you may hear me say, you know, to, to, uh, uh, to angry people that everything sounds like ignorance, even the wisdom of God. Why? Because sometimes you can't rationalize with anger when they've embraced it, right? And it doesn't matter if you're releasing the wisdom of God. It doesn't matter if you're giving them good counsel. Sometimes because they're so angry and they've allowed this thing to affect them so bad, everything in their life appears as ignorance, especially when it comes from you because they want you to feel their pain. So we understand that the enemy is always going to attack through circumstance. We understand that God has called you to move forward in the ground, not to be lukewarm, not to stay where you're at, not to, there's a, there's, when you take ground, it's okay to consolidate. You know, we did that in the military and set up a defensive perimeter and distribute ammunition, do a head check, make sure everybody's okay. Before we get up and we move into the next ground, it's okay to take a break. But you, it, when we set up that defensive perimeter, we have to, Understand that when I drive an enemy out of a land, the first thing we do is we set up a defensive perimeter because we're always aware of a counterattack. And when the enemy does not do the counterattack, we keep people in that place and we take another group like a fire team and we go venture out and we push forward into that land. And like I said, the Bible says in Luke eleven twenty four 24, it says when an unclean spirit comes out of a person, it's always going to come back. And what does it say in the Amplified? It says, I will go back to my house from which I came. So the enemy believes that if you are driven out of, if he's driven out of your heart, he still thinks it's his house, right? And he has the right to come back. But we understand that when that place is filled with the spirit of God, you now have the strong man who's the Holy Spirit in your heart with Jesus and the enemy will not be able to force him out, right? So the law of lift, when I went back to uh, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, it says the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. The lifting up is a law of lift. Now we have to understand here on this earth, we have gravity. And it doesn't matter when you're a little child, if you trip, you're going to fall. Why? Gravity is going to cause you to come down. It doesn't matter what your level of education about gravity is. Gravity exists, right? But to the same degree that we have gravity is the same degree that we have the law of lift. Well, what does the law of lift do? I have it in, in my notes that, that uh, the more opposition, when a plane is taking off, that's why it takes off into the wind. The more the opposition, the more the lift. The greater the wind, the greater the lift. Lift displaces air down from the wings by displacing the air. So just like wings are designed for lift, you were created for worship the law of lift applies to worship. So when gravity tries to push you down, there is a law of lift through worship that will always lift you up, right? And we've been talking about grace in every single form. I've been talking about we're in the first heaven, we're in a terrestrial realm, right? Um, I've been talking about the enemy attacking from a second heaven. But I've also said that the throne of grace is at the third heaven and we're seated in heavenly places with Jesus, Ephesians 2 and 6, that every time we run into a circumstance, your attacks may be rooted in the second heaven and may impact the first heaven. But Jesus says, when you pray, pray that 
my kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven or our kingdom. So we're to pray that the kingdom of God from the third heaven manifest in the first. And what happens when we reach up and we pull down grace? I said last week at church, I think it's Proverbs um, uh, 21, 22, says a warrior filled with wisdom ascends into the high place. And it says that warrior releases regional breakthrough. What does it do? It, it brings down the strongholds of the mighty. So when we ascend in the worship into the third heaven, what, what do we do? We bring down the strongholds of the mighty. So we have to understand that we had a Paul and we had a Silas that were in prison. They were in a place of bondage. They were in a place of decay. And what did they do? They, it said that they prayed and they worshiped. So let's talk about praise first. I'm going to go backwards. In Isaiah 60 and 18, and this is interesting, it says, but you will call your wall salvation and your gates praise. Did you hear me? You will call your wall salvation and your gates praise. Understand God's salvation is his part and praise is your part. What is salvation? You'll see, hear me say it over and over again. Salvation, uh, the basis in the New Testament is sozo. And sozo in the Greek speaks of the forgiveness from God the deliverance from God. Now, deliverance deals with the molestation of enemies, deliverance from that molestation and bringing you out of something and bringing you into something else. And it talks about healing, whether it's physical healing or whether it's emotional healing. So you have forgiveness, you have deliverance, and you have healing. That is made available to the children of God, right? And because that is our covenant, the church needs to, uh, they need to train just as much as they teach. We're very big on the teaching, but when it comes to the demonstration and the training, that's where the church lacks. We talk about when we see somebody online, online that, hey, you know, mom has cancer. Well, I'm praying for you. Is that a term that you are being courtesy, uh, courteous about that situation? Or do you really believe Psalms 107 and 20 that when you send the word that you're going to be able to deliver them from their destruction, Right. We have to start understanding principles, not just understanding. We have to start applying them as a church. It's not good enough just to know the word. You have to understand who the spirit of God is within that word, because when I release the word by the spirit of God, it says life is supposed to show up. John 6, 63, and I'm going to cover that. Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and their life. When I speak the words that God is speaking, I'm speaking them under the unction of the Holy Spirit. It says the words I speak are spirit and the life. So what happens when I speak by the spirit of God? The life of God manifests and shows up, even in a place of bondage and decay and darkness. When I speak by the spirit of God, the life of God and the life of the kingdom shows up, right? And that was key. When Jesus spoke, there was something about him speaking that you see through scripture. It penetrated the hearts of men. Why did Jesus, when Jesus stepped out onto the water, when, when, when Peter thought he was a ghost, why did he say, tell me to come? Because he knew the voice of Jesus better than any other voice. He knew when the voice came from men, they were just words. But he knew when Jesus spoke, something burned within him. So he knew that even though he did not recognize the form, he recognized the word of God when it hit his life because something in his heart burned. And that's how he was able to trust Jesus in the midst of a storm when he thought he was a ghost. He understood the source because he understood the voice of God. So let's continue on because we're talking about praise. So I said, um, you'll call your wall salvation and your gates praise. So salvation is his part. Praise is mine, right? Then let's go two chapters forward. Isaiah 62 and 1. Watch this. And her salvation is like a torch that is burning. So your praise forms the walls of fire that are around you. Because it says right there, salvation is like a torch that is burning. So if they'll call my wall salvation, my walls are now on fire because of my praise, right? It's, it says that my walls will be formed as fire around me. Zechariah 2 and 5, watch this. Then I myself will be a protective wall around Jerusalem, says the Lord, and I will be the glory inside the city. The wall of fire around us is our salvation. So you're saying when I get to a place of praise, God will meet me in that place and God will put a wall of salvation or a wall of fire around me? Absolutely. So what happens is when the enemy tries to start messing with me, 
I leave this place. I leave this circumstance. I get into a place of worship. I get into a place of praying in the spirit, which I didn't put in my notes. I just realized uh, Jude um, uh, 1 and 20. Go ahead and look it up in the Amplified. Um, but what happens is when I get into a place of praise and when I get into a place of worship, all of a sudden there's an elevation that hits my life and it takes me to a higher place. So worship is mandatory because we have to go up to a higher place uh, in God. Revelation 21, 21, it says the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. So what is a pearl? And Bill Johnson teaches us, what is a pearl and how is it created? Pearls are developed by pressure and irritation. Pearls are developed by pressure and irritation. So the gates of praise are built by responding to difficulty by glorifying God. So everyone can celebrate their victories, but how do you celebrate in a time of loss? How do you celebrate in a place of setback? I'm looking up Jude 20. Um, you know, how do we respond, right? And so we have to understand that when we are in a difficult situation, the first thing that we have to do is we have to go to God. And when we go to God, we go to God and worship. But we worship God and we praise God based on the testimonies, based on the words, based on his goodness, based on the things that he said he promises, based on what he's already done in our lives, right? So we go back to God and we don't acknowledge that situation because if God inhabits my praises, then who inhabits your complaining? Think about this. If God inhabits my praises, then who inhabits my gossip? Who inhabits my complaining? The enemy. So why would I validate the evil working in someone else's life? Because the second I do that, I'm now empowering them. And I'm now empowering the voices of darkness, right? So we run into people, we all run into people that are crazy, that are miserable, that are hurt, that are frustrated. But when we start affirming and complaining about them, who's inhabiting our complaint? It's the forces of darkness. That's why you don't hear me talk about sickness if, if, I, I, if I don't feel well. You don't hear me talk about it. When I'm going through hardship, Kristen, Kristen asked me this week, because Kristen's been dealing with some stuff. And, and, and I'm gonna bring her out and give a testimony. But she's just like, it, it just doesn't seem like you ever go through anything. No, I don't confess it. And I'm not saying she's confessing it. What I'm saying is I know what she's going through and we got to talk about these things. But when she's going through things, I don't want to kind of burden her with my stuff. But am I going through it? You think when I wrote that empowered thing, I didn't go through anything. Every force in the pit of hell came at me when I started writing the you know, the empowered that, that we did, um, the manual for breakthrough, you know, and that's going to be changed. I already saw some flaws in it. So I got to, I'm going to expand on that. But when I wrote this manual and God told me to write it, everything came at me and I was like, wow. And then you guys start reading it. You're like, oh my God, everything's hitting me. It's like, yeah, you don't think it hit me first, you know? And the good thing is you guys are playing, you got a covering. So we have to understand that when we go to God in a place of praise, we literally put a wall of fire around us and the enemy cannot touch us. I was, I was watching uh, TV Joshua and I like watching ministries out of Africa when witches and, and Satanists try to curse the children of God that are filled with the spirit of God. And every single one of them say, I couldn't get around them. I couldn't even get to them because all I saw was fire in their eyes. I saw fire around them. Everywhere I saw, I saw a fire. I could not get to those people. Why couldn't you get to them? Because those are people of praise. Those are people that put, by the Spirit of God, a wall of fire all the way around them. Anytime you get in a messed up situation, I go to God and I praise Him, and I worship Him, and I stay in that place. And man, it doesn't take long before I feel 10 feet tall and bulletproof, and I feel the Spirit of God come down in my situation, and I have this unusual peace, regardless of what's going on in my life, that just manifests, and even though things in the natural look messed up, in my spirit, I'm like, man, it's going to be all right. I don't, I don't know how, but man, when the Spirit of God comes and, and, and inhabits my praise like that, I just know, man, all is well, right? So we have to understand, in the midst of a prison, they decided to praise God, right? So it says that about midnight, Paul and Silas, they were praying and singing, singing hymns of praise. 
One thing I did not put in your notes, you might want to put in there, Jude 1 and 20. And I put it in the Amplified. It says, but you, beloved, build yourselves up on the foundation of your most holy faith. Continue progress. Now watch this. Rise like an edifice higher and higher. Pray in the spirit. What does it say? It says praying in the spirit is going to lift you higher and higher. Not only do we praise God, but in worship, I pray in the spirit. What does it say? It lifts me higher and higher. What am I doing? I'm going to the high place of God. I'm going and I'm getting into grace. What am I doing? I'm going to the third heaven to destroy every lofty thing that set itself up against the knowledge of God in my life. Everything in the uh, second heaven is destroyed and everything in the first heaven, which is our circumstance, changes. So every time pressure comes in my life, I rise. Law of lift, right? It takes opposition for me to take off. So I praise God, I pray in the spirit, and then I pray based on the things God said he was going to do in my life. I have this thing right here that I've had up here for a couple weeks. So on my computer, God said, January 23rd is my breakthrough. So I'm like, okay. So, and guess what happened this week? All sorts of crazy started going on. Do I know exactly what breakthrough looks like? No, but I celebrated God for it anyways, because I trust if God said he's doing it, that, that it's going to manifest in my life. So we have to understand when I went back about the word of God being challenged, that there's tribulation because of the word. First Timothy 1 and 8, I'm going to get into prayer. So we talked about praise. So in praise, I listen to worship. I pray in the spirit. And whatever God has me declare, I declare it. But one thing I always go back is I go back to the promises, which are prophetic, right? First Timothy 1.18, it's in your notes. Now, let me stop right here. Let me go back. I said Jude 1 and 20. It says that we pray in the spirit and it lifts us higher. When we go to Romans 8, 28, it says, for we know that uh, all things work for the good of those who love God have been called according to your purpose. We have to also understand that's in uh, Romans 8, 28. We have to understand before those verses that that verse is based on you praying in the spirit because we have to understand that a lot of times we want to pray and we want to control God as far as how God is going to bring it out. So God commissions us to pray in the spirit because now we're praying mysteries, but what we're doing is we're releasing the Holy Spirit to move in our life based on God's agenda, not based on ours. Now God will, he will partner up with us in our desire because desire literally means from the father, but we have to understand that God wants to do it his way, right? So let him do it his way. Quit being so dang controlling. Because what happens is when God starts answering your prayer and it doesn't look like your answer, you bring the issue back to you and you allow the enemy to attack you. So the enemy is attacking you because you said, I gave it to God. Now you took it back. And here's what I do. And I, I keep talking about this. When you release it to God, give it to God. Don't take it back. Right? Anytime the enemy attacks you, let the enemy know it's not my possession anymore. He's got it. It's, it's his hot potato. He's got to deal with it, right? And allow the peace of God to come upon you because God said he'll finish the good work he began in you and he'll perfect the very thing that concerns you, right? And he says, I'll oppose those who oppose you. These are all promises. But going back to Romans 8, it says, because uh, it's not my notes, it says that Romans 8, Okay, it says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings deep for our words, intercedes. So he's actually praying for you. The Holy Spirit is praying for you when you pray in the Spirit. Now, he's not lining up with the way in which you want God to do it. He's lining up with the end result. And the Bible says, as the heavens are, uh, are above the earth, so his ways are higher than our ways. Let God answer the prayer the way he wants to. And when you give it to him, leave it with him, knowing that God heard your prayer and that God is fulfilling it. And it says in verse 27, and he who searches the, searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So through your praying in the spirit, he's actually interceding for you to the Father, and then it says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. 
It's saying the fruit of you praying in the Spirit is the Holy Spirit working with the Father, making sure all things are working out for your good. So when pressure comes in, I go to God with praise. And when pressure comes in, I pray in the Spirit, right? So those are a couple things that I do. Here's the third thing I do when I'm in that place. I affirm the prophetic already spoken over my life. I affirm the, the, the word of God that's been written for me as my inheritance into my life. Why? It's a contradictory word. When circumstance doesn't look like it's lining up, I speak to the circumstance. Job 22 and 28 says, whatever I decide and decree, meaning I decree it, meaning I'm a ruler, I'm a son of royalty, I am royalty, I speak it, I decree it. What does it say God does? It says he establishes it. What does uh, Jeremiah 1 and 12 says? God watches over his word and fulfills it. What does Mark 16 and 20 says? And he worked with him and... Uh, and, and he confirmed the word spoken by signs and wonders following, right? So there is confirmation on the word, Luke 1 and 37, for no word from God will fail. So we have to understand the promises over our lives and release it to God. <clears throat> so they're in a place of prison. And I talked about, uh, I talked about your praise. I talked about you praying in the spirit. Now let's talk about prayer. <clears throat> Excuse me. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.18, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command. What was Timothy dealing with? You got to kind of pull back. What was Timothy dealing with? He was dealing with pressure. Why? Because he had an audience that was older. He was dealing with a fear issue. He was dealing with intimidation. Anytime you're intimidated, you never even try. Because you always say, well, that's just my anxiety. Well, alcoholism is genetic. You know, there's nothing I could do about that. Anytime you are intimidated, it's an opportunity for you not to move, Right? So, and it says that God did not give you that spirit, the spirit of timidity or the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. So that, that spirit that comes upon you to stop you, to make you not try, is a spirit from the pit of hell. So we have to understand that. So Timothy was dealing with, he was young in his age. But if you read the book of Timothy, Paul said, well, hold on a sec. Your grandmother had a spirit of faith on her. Your mom had a spirit of faith on her. And I believe that that is your inheritance and that you have a spirit of faith on you. And I'm going to call forth that inheritance. So he said, I'm giving you this command with the prophecies. So God already spoke a word into his life and he was dealing with some fear issues. <clears throat> How did he tell him to respond? By recalling them. You may fight the battle well. Now watch this. I put in your notes about re to recall something. The prefix, the, the prefix re, R-E, it means to do again or go back to its original state. Think about this. He said to take your prophecy and recall them. What is he saying? He's saying, go back to them. Go back to the original word that's been spoken over your life. Whenever we read anything, we're moving backwards. So remember, redeem. I'm going to give you some words. Remember the, these words. Redeem, restore, repent, reconcile, resurrection, return, recompense, renew, reward, all of these relate in one way or another to God's plan of salvation for humanity, right? So revival is to what? Revive. Bring something back to life. Watch this. I said, I said last year God started the reformation of the church. What does that mean? It Go back to the beginning and God's purpose for his church. Oh, so God is renewing people back to the original state of the church. The original reason, the original purpose, go back to that. Where did that start? Genesis 1 and 28. If we're going to talk about the dispensation of a new covenant, we're going to go to Matthew 28, uh, 18 through 21, right? So we have to understand what God is doing in this season, but we're talking about prayer, right? And when we recall prophecies, the first thing that hit me was call, the word call. First thing that hit me was Jeremiah 33 and 3. What is that? Jeremiah 33 and 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you the great and mighty things that you don't know. Now, if you look up the word mighty, mighty says inaccessible. And God says when you call upon him, he's going to give you access to the inaccessible. Oh, he's going to speak the hidden wisdom or, or the riches that he has destined for you for all time, that God will make that available to you when you need it. So you're saying when I get to a place of unknown, when I get to a place where I feel there's no doors, when I get to a place where I feel that there's things that are not accessible, you said I can call to you and you'll make 
The inaccessible accessible. Yeah, that's called grace. Oh, ask, seek, and knock, right? So when we recall things, we go back to the initial call and we go back to God. God, what did you call me to? Oh, now I remember. So we have to remember the prophecies and the things that God spoke over us. Remember, Acts 16, 25, and 26, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. Interesting. So what were they praying? Think about this. What were they praying? What is prayer? Prayer is communication. It's two ways. It's going to God and God coming back to you. It's releasing the very thing that God gave you back to him. What does faith do? Faith always produces grace. So when I have faith in the word of God, God releases grace into my life. What did they pray? They were praying the prophecies as far as what they were actually called to. And why were they praising? Because they were thanking God that God is faithful to his word, that no word from God will fail, even in the midst of a dungeon, even in a place of darkness, even in a place of bondage and decay, they gave praise to God and they prayed him for it, or they prayed for it, right? So John 6, 63, I'm gonna get a little bit deeper. I kind of touched on this, but I wanna make sure you guys got this. It's in your notes. Your notes are right there, so make sure you download them. Uh, John 6, 63 says, Jesus said this, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh, now I did this in the Amplified, the flesh conveys no benefit. It's of no account. So the flesh will profit you nothing, right? The flesh will profit you nothing. Now watch Jesus. The words I've spoken to you, they are spirit and their life. And it says in the Amplified, after life provides eternal life. So watch this. So when the words are spoken from God, they manifest into the presence of God, which carries the very life of God. Did you hear me? When words are spoken from God, that's why he says, the words I speak are spirit and life. He says, when I release the spirit of the word, right? Jesus was spirit and he manifested in the flesh, John 1 and 14. Jesus started off his spirit. He manifested and he was birthed in the flesh. So he started spirit. He manifested in the flesh. He's saying, now I'm a fleshly creature, but I was created first in the spirit. So as a man here on earth, I'm going to release words by the spirit of God. And when I release words by the spirit of God, I'm also releasing the life of God into the very thing that I'm speaking to. Remember that the Bible says in Isaiah 55 and 11, it says that, uh, no word will fall to ground empty. It'll accomplish its goal and it'll prosper in the area that I send it to. Why is it saying that? Because I have the authority over the word to send the word of God into any circumstance, in any situation by the grace of God from the third heaven into a first heaven reality, into a second heaven reality and change it. How? Because light is greater than darkness, right? There's a power of righteousness that's working in and through my life. So all of a sudden I release the word of God by the spirit of God and life shows up. How does this tie in? Because someone asked me about prayer this week, and I explained to them, actually, um, I, I sent this, uh, she's on the call, I sent this this morning. So we have to understand, if I speak by the Spirit of God, and by the Spirit of God, I'm sending the life and nature of God into a situation, then 107, Psalm 107, 20 says this, he sent his word and healed them and rescued them from their destruction. How did I do that? I spoke words by the spirit of God, which were the life of God. And I sent the life of God by the word of God into somebody that was facing destruction. And what did it do? It delivered them out of their mess, right? That's why I intercede and I pray and I don't give up because you cannot resist the word of God for your life. You're eventually going to give in, give in. If I prayed a prophetic prayer over your life and you're like, yeah, I'm not doing it. Guess what it does. You ever get those turkey taps when you're a kid? I know my older brother and his friends used to hold me down and they just slightly tap and they kept tapping. At first, it doesn't bother you. After a while, it drives you absolutely crazy. It's kind of like that. The word of God is just going to keep doing this on your heart until you eventually respond. Some people got a little more willpower. God will break that thing down. I don't care. So the Holy Spirit will ensure that the life of God gets into a situation and it will conform it to a kingdom reality. James 1 and 21. I'm wrapping this thing up. James 1 and 21. Therefore, it says, ridding yourselves of all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness is talking about the flesh zone. In humility, it says, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Now, you got to understand, I'm going to break some religion here. 
it says in humility. What is humility? Humility is a strength that is, um, it's a strength that's restrained. Everybody looks at humility, especially in the church world, um, everybody looks at humility as being some sort of weakness. No. Do you know in the military, um, when I was, I, I had about five or six MOS as military occupational skills, my primary MOS was a 03041. I was a mortarman. So I sat in a defilade position and I had 60 millimeter mortars and I was in charge of three mortar sections, which is three men per mortar. So there's there's nine people. I had a forward observer, which was usually me. And I had a lot of working components. Now I had a lot of strength. Why? Because I had 60 millimeter mortars. Now I was in the Marine Corps. So did that mean I can go and just shoot mortars wherever I wanted to? No, because I didn't want to injure people because of friendly fire. Does that mean when I got off on the weekend, I could go take my mortar with me and just, you know, hey, uh, uh, ex-girlfriend, take me off on an aim a mortar at her, at, her, at, her, at her car and just blow it up? No, I can't. Why? Because that wasn't its use. Think about this. It wasn't its use. So what is humility? Humility is realizing a strength, but you're using it for the kingdom and the kingdom only, and you release it. You release that anointing into someone's life based on the instruction of God. You better understand the humility of God is understanding the strength of God working in your life, but it is subject to God and the voice of God for your life. That's why when I'm at the altar, I don't pray for every single person. That's why, you know, when people called me last week, two people that were demonized, I didn't run out to their house. Why? Because I wasn't called to release something in their life. I stayed in humility before God, because what does ego say when someone demonized walks into the ministry? Especially when you're dealing with a dude, I'm going to slap the devil upside the head. I'm going to make the, the demon scream and leave and all this other stuff. That's all ego. That's pride. Why? Because has God called me to release that strength? No, he has not. So what am I doing releasing the anointing in my life or the presence of the Holy Spirit into a place I have not been called to. Think about that. So you have to come to the realization that the Spirit of God dwells within you, that the gifts of the Spirit, there's nine of them, dwells within you by one Spirit, and we release those giftings based on our position in God, and we are His bond servant. When God says release it, you release it. When God says lay hands, you see me at the altar. Some of you guys, when I grab your hands to show you that God will work through you, you see I pull your hand back. Why? It's not time yet. It's not time yet. So we have to understand the timing for the gifting that's being released out of our life, right? So you see, sometimes I'll pull your hand back. It's not, it's not there yet. We'll let it build. Okay, now it's built. Now go, boom. So humility is a strength that is restrained for his use. Pride is taking your gift and saying, I don't need God, I don't need you, and pride releases it into any situation, right? Any situation, even the places that you are not called to. Humility stays under God, right? Stays planted in the church. I got parking lot prophets that come and go, right? But they're not humble. Why? Because their gift is not submitted to the kingdom. They may say it is, and I'm just doing it for the glory of God. Great, who's your pastor? Well, you know, I don't need a pastor. I hear from God. Cool. Yes, you do. So anyways, I'm not going to, I'm not going to chase that too far down the road, but understand humility identifies you as a person of power, identifies you as a person of strength, right? So we have to understand that and we have to release our gifting into a situation only which God calls us to. So we're on this place of prayer, right? So I put, therefore, ridding yourselves of all filthiness and all that remains wickedness in humility it's talking about your heart and your soul condition right and it says receive the word implanted so the word of god is a seed watch this the soil doesn't have power the seed does the soil doesn't have power the seed does i'm talking heart condition the soil does not have power the seed does so it says in humility receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls so we have to understand humility is strength or strength, and we have to understand <coughs> that the soil doesn't contain the power, the seed does. And the life of God is in the seed of God, right? And we have to understand because the life of God is in the seed of God that is spoken, grace enables what it commands, and when the instruction is released, the ability and life of God is released within that seed or within that word for me to grab hold and plant it into somebody else in humility. 
because that's where God's directing it. Not into this person, not in that person, not in that person, but the person that I'm talking to when I hear that in humility, I release the seed of God into a life of a believer. <coughs> and what does it say? It says it'll save your souls. Going back to salvation, what is it again? In the Greek, sozo, forgiveness of sins, deliverance from the molestation of enemies, to take them out of one place and into another, and healing emotionally as well as physically. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna um, close with this. A couple more scriptures. You like that? There's a there's a power of righteousness. So you have to get this one right here. Matthew 14 and 13, it says John was beheaded, right? And John was beheaded, came to a crowd, and it says, you know, uh, John was beheaded, and a crowd comes to Jesus. So John's beheaded, and a crowd comes to Jesus. When John was beheaded, Jesus was bummed out. He wasn't happy. He was like, wow, that was a blow. Why? Because it kind of reminded him of what his call was, what his cup was to drink, right? That he was going to die for humanity. So when John was beheaded, I'm sure that there was a reality that whew, reminded him of what he was going to have to go through. But then it said a crowd came to him, and it says when Jesus saw the crowd, he was filled with compassion. Then it says a little further on, it sent the, he sent the disciples off, and then what did Jesus do? In the midst of this kind of heaviness, says he went to the mountain to pray. He went to a high place, right? And my point being is when you are challenged by pressure or your circumstance and you're facing breakthrough, you're dealing with that whole dark night of the soul, that's the place where we have to refine our focus, right? That's the place. When you are in a prison, what do you do? You bring light in through the word of God, through prayer, remembering, remembering the testimonies that were prophesied over your life, right? Remembering your praise, worshiping God, knowing that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So we have to refine our focus. When, when you need all of your strength to do the one thing that you were created to do, which is to go to the mountain, we have to pray and we have to settle some issues in our heart. So when we are in the midst of circumstance that sucks, we have to settle some issues in our heart. When everybody's tugging on us and when circumstance doesn't look good, we have to settle issues in our heart. We don't wait for the season of pain to come upon us, you know, to, to, to try and figure things out. We don't just come to church when, when you know, our, our, uh, our platform and the place we are standing comes out from under us. No, we do this in a place of, of, of strength. Why? Because it's in a place of strength that we take the blessing of the burden for tomorrow on us today. We start absorbing the pressure of it. Why? Because there's weight in that blessing. So we got to start preparing for it in a place of strength. Will the enemy try and come and come after you in that place of strength? Absolutely. But you're in a place of strength, right? So we have to refine our focus because when that storm hits, we got to stay connected and we need a word from God. So Jesus came off the mountain. Think about this. So Jesus, after John's beheaded, he comes off the mountain and those that touched him became well. I'm talking about the power of righteousness. So what am I saying? When I refine my focus, I'm saying that I cannot have thoughts in my head that God doesn't think about me. My thoughts have to line up with the word of God. Second uh, Corinthians um, 10, three through six, right? It says that there's coping mechanisms in my thought process right? That are demonic. And I have to challenge them by the word of God. And I put this post and, and I don't know where it is. I sent a text out to a couple people. I want you to think about this one. And these are nuggets I chew on every day. Do you know what mental illness is? Think about this. Do you know what mental illness is? Mental illness is the cause of the breakdown of a coping mechanism in somebody else's mind that failed them. Think about this. They were just trying to protect themselves and their protection mechanism in their life failed. Mental illness is when people deal with trauma and they deal with all the bad things. And all of a sudden they try to create these coping mechanisms in their life. And those coping mechanisms absolutely fail them. What does the word of God say? The word of God says in Isaiah 54 and 17, read the Amplified. It says there's no weapon that has been forged or formed in your life that can prosper against you. In the message, it acknowledges that God created all things, but there's nothing in creation that could be forged or formed against you and prosper against you. And then what does it say after this? It says, 
this is our heritage. This is our heritage. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I shall condemn every tongue that rises up against me in judgment. This is the heritage of the saints, and our vindication comes from him. Who's my protector? Jesus. What, do I, what happens when I praise? A wall of fire comes around me. Oh, I'm untouchable. When I stay connected, when I stay in the promise, guys, I've been through some stuff. I've been breaking some ground, and the enemy's been trying to push against me. But I've been going and breaking his back and breaking his back and breaking his back. And what happens after the you? What happens after that? Then I bring you guys into it, right? So we go back to Isaiah 59 and 19. It says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood because of the word, not just the word, the tribulation, right? Because it says the word's going to get challenged. It says the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. How does the spirit of the Lord lift up a standard? Grace. Grace enables what it commands. God releases a greater word than that of the storm and tells you in a place of worship and tells you in a place of praise how he's going to deal with it. He sends his spirit upon you. He envelops you with a wall of salvation or a wall of fire and he protects you, right? Now watch this. I'm going to use the same verse I started. Acts 16, 25 through 26. It says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and they were singing hymns of praise to God. Watch this. And the prisoners were listening. Did you hear me? And the prisoner, why would it put in the Bible and the prisoners were listening? Maybe they put it because they wanted to show you that your praise and your prayer doesn't just affect you. It affects everybody in your atmosphere. I'm talking about the power of righteousness. I'm talking about the atmosphere that you walk in. When you walk into a place, the Holy Spirit shows up when you invite him. The Holy, remember, the Holy Spirit's in you for you, but he's on you for other people. When I get in that place of praise, I'm a dangerous man. Why? Because anybody standing around me gets affected and impacted, right? So it says, and the prisoners were listening to them. Were they complaining? Were they empowering the demonic? No. It says they were listening. So if they're listening, what are they doing? They're receiving. So you have to understand they're in a place of bondage. They're in a place of prison. They're in a place of darkness. They're in a place of decay. And what were they doing? They were listening to Paul and Silas. And it says, and suddenly there came a great earthquake, earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. What happens when pressure comes in my life and I pray and I pray to God and I praise? What happens on the inside happens on the outside. When you praise and you worship God, there's a shaking that happens on the inside of you. You shake off anxiety. You shake off fear, you shake off sickness, you shake off hardship, you shake off everything. It is shaken off of you. And then what happens? Everything shakes around you and it impacts the atmosphere around you. So when they declared the word of God and they praised God for it, the Holy Spirit showed up with the kingdom of God. Romans 14 and 17, the Holy Spirit showed up with the kingdom of God and everyone who heard Paul and Silas were set free. Internal realities always manifest externally. The spirit of God will always influence natural situations. When your perception changes, your circumstance will change. All we're doing is realigning our focus in this season, and we're putting God first above everything that we're going through in life. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, 14, it talks about one woman in a house, but it's talking about the power of righteousness. When one person in the house is holy, Everything in the house becomes holy. Everything within the hearing of my ear has to be set free. And they have to experience the reality of the kingdom. John 8, 32 says, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. And it says, we're, uh, no, it says in John 8, 32, it says, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Truth is experiencing the reality of the kingdom, right? Knowing will always lead to an experience. Psalms 34 and 8. Taste and see that he's good. And experience with God will always shift your perception about God. I want to bring out, and I, and I went about 15 minutes. I want to bring out Kristen. And um, we don't just talk about this. This is stuff we live. How you doing? Hi. Kristen, you've been kind of, you've been taking ground. But can I, can I set the, uh, can I set the groundwork for you? I don't know. So, Are you going to steal my whole testimony? No, I'm not. But I am going to say this. <laughs> So you guys that were in breakthrough, remember I, I prophesied over a few people? 
Well, I prophesied over a few people and I talked about tribulation coming because of the word. All of a sudden, we just kind of put down, you know, whatever, and we go back to life. And I didn't realize that she was going through a mess because of, but go ahead and, and, and talk about it, Kristen. Okay. Yeah. And thanks, Greg. That was a good word today. Um, so I, I feel that it's been ever since we started that whole breakthrough class and now we're in, empowered because um, it's been about a month or more that I've got these bullies that have been at work. Uh, working in the birth center is already stressful as it is. It's just, <laughs> it's a lot of hard work and emotionally trying. And, and now I've had these bullies that have been coming at me belittling me, bossing me around, calling me names. Um, and I've been dealing with upper management, you know, my manager and director, um, trying to confront it. And they're still trying to figure out how to approach these bullies and basically just leaving me to deal with it on my own so far, which has been really hard. And um, stirring up anxiety that I haven't had to you know, battle with for 20 years. I overcame my anxiety 20 years ago. Um, and here I am faced again, going into a job that is already stressful, wanting to quit and afraid to face these women. And um, so <clears throat> for example, yesterday I was assigned to work in the OR, um, do a C-section with one of these bullies. And as soon as I found out one of these bullies was gonna be in there, that anxiety started raising again and that attack started coming on me. And I just started praying in tongues under my mask and I literally just shook it off. <laughs> one of my coworkers in there, uh, sister in Christ with me, she's always had my back she started laughing at me because I'm literally shaking and she she can hear me praying in tongues before this case was starting before these doctors and you know assists and everyone else came in to that OR and I just I felt this release over me and, hey, and Kristen, I just, what talk, talk about how this started this started with you you know um, just doing a good deed and, and yeah, I'll get, I'll get to that. Okay. I'll get to that. Um, and I just was like, I just spoke that it's not me that should fear her. It's her that should fear me. And I felt this peace over me. And um, like Greg start, uh, said, you know, this all started, okay, I we have comment cards that these patients write. And um, I am one of the number one most praised nurses, one of the most recognized nurses on these comment cards that get posted on the wall. Um, and this one patient in particular last month, I happened to deliver the baby myself while pulling her in a wheelchair running while I was running backwards. If that's not talent, I don't know what was. <laughs> and Everybody was like, you're a hero. That's amazing. You know, I have the nurses applauding me, cheering for me. And one particular woman is coming at me saying, no, you didn't deliver that baby. No, you didn't do this. You were just getting in everyone's way. Yada, yada, yada. Just lies, lies, lies. Really tore me down. And with all the praise that everybody was giving me, I was just lingering on these words of this one person and it destroyed me. I, I almost quit my job and walked out. I was just done with the abuse. Um, I'd already been getting it from her and another gal and straw broke the camel's back. But my, my um, director and my manager just have been praising me um, sending me emails, tell me how, how great of a job that was. Um, you know, this, this patient had posted it on YouTube for the world to see. And so they all saw the video. They all saw what I did and they knew the truth. 
You know, God knows the truth. I know the truth. Whether this bully wanted to believe it or not, she was jealous. And, and so the director wanted to make sure, no, Kristen, don't leave us. You're valuable. I just want to let you know that what you did was amazing. These patients are so grateful for all that you do. And we're grateful for all that you do for us. You know, and I've got charge nurses that, you know, shoot me kudos here and there. And so, you know, it, it gives me the warm and fuzzies and it builds my, my confidence, but it's definitely been a struggle and it's still a, a battle because the director and the manager still need to address <laughs> these bullies. So we're not quite through to the other side yet, but, but it's a welcoming feeling knowing that people recognize me for, for my greatness and that I am doing what God called me to do despite all these bullies. And I know it's hurtful and I know people go through um, challenges like this everywhere they go, you know, at their workplace or at school or, you know, even at church. And, and like Greg said, you just, you just got to, let that lift take you up and just be aware that that they're the ones that have the pain these women they have this ugliness in it and you can see you can see they have just this ugliness in their soul and when they get around me they start getting twitchy and they start getting weird because because they're anointing on me you know they start they start getting uncomfortable and the only way they can handle it is just by attacking me and trying to bring me down to their level. And I'm just not going to deal with it anymore. And whether or not my upper management does eventually confront them, I know that I stood my ground and I confronted them. I said what I had to say, said my piece. I kept it professional and, um, I just kept praying in tongues every time I faced them again, since any of the harsh incidences, I've just been praying in tongues and knowing that I don't need to fear you. It's you that needs to fear being around me. It's you that has the problem with me, not the other way around. I will just sit there with my smirk under my mask and know that God is on my side, regardless of what you do. And so I was able to go through that C-section yesterday, for example, with just no problem and um, faced that woman. And, you know, late, later I walked by her, and this is kind of a side note, later I walked by her, um, behind her, she didn't see me. And she was, you know, excuse my language, a bitch into somebody about me saying, why the hell haven't they gotten rid of her yet? Why the hell is she still here? And they're trying to get me fired. They're trying to get me out of there. But they're the ones that need to go because I'm going to stay planted until God calls me to somewhere else. And I'm going to keep doing what I do until God tells me where I need to go. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to make the best of it and, and hunker down and buckle in through these bumpy rides until God removes them. And so I just have faith that it's going to work out because it's already starting. The lift off is the lift off is already starting. Yeah. So. And that's, that, that's a good word. And, and in the midst of all this, when, when Kristen's kind of coming home and, and, you know, just, I'm going to, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm like, what are you doing on your computer? Well, I'm, I'm creating a resume and I'm like, I'm like, hold on a sec, you know? And it was interesting that when it came to a peak, um, I opened up my Bible and, and her prophetic word was sitting right there. And I'm like, then it just dawned on me. I said, Kristen, I said, what was the word? I said, all will come to know you by name. And what they're doing is they're fighting you. They're fighting your identity and they're fighting your name. They're fighting the very reason that you're called, but this came from a pit of hell. So I sent her a snapshot of a prophetic word. And I said, this is why you are being attacked. It's your identity. And you have to remember what God said he's doing for you in this season. And the enemy is trying to contend for you to contend 
with you for that word because we prophesied this is a season of flourishing for you. And all of a sudden, oppression immediately came in. And then we sent the prophetic word. And then it's like, oh, that's why everything's coming against me. Why the prophetic word was released, right? So we have to understand in these seasons that the way in which we break the back of the enemy is through prayer, is through our testimony, and through our praise, thanking God that he's going to do the very thing that he spoke over our lives. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this thing up. Um, and, and I'm going to end it by prayer. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I bless your people this morning. Lord, your blessing, it says, brings wealth without painful toil or sorrow. It's unmerited grace, Father, not because we, we deserve it, but because your son did it for us, Lord God. For, Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over each and every person that's within the sound of my voice. I plead the blood of Jesus over their lives, over their families, over their houses, over their stuff. In the name of Jesus, I declare that the angels of the Lord encamp about each and every one of you in your families, Lord God, because they're the ones who inherit salvation. Lord, I thank you that they will have uh, an experience with you that will change their perception of you. Lord God, I pray that you continue to pour out your grace upon their lives, Lord God, that everything they put their hands to prospers, Lord God. Give them abounding grace in all things. And, and Holy Spirit, come upon your people not just for them, but for the people around them to impact the atmosphere around them. It's the power of righteousness. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in their lives. And thank you guys for showing up this morning. Guys, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and tomorrow we're going to, we're going to continue on. We didn't get too far uh, last week on, on the, uh, on the deliverance portion. We're going to go back through starting with, we're going to do the five steps to deliverance. We're going to go back uh, through step one. Cause I think we got step one, but we talked about forgiveness for about 45 minutes. So we're going to go back through there tomorrow. And uh, and then we're just going to move forward. And, and again, if it's something where, hey, we're hung up on a subject, you know, we can go ahead and, and, and prolong this for a couple of weeks just to make sure that you guys get everything you came there for. So that's it. I'm going to be around if you guys need me, but I'm going to I'm going to wrap this thing today. Thanks, Pastor Greg and Kristen. Right. Have a good day, everyone.